Right. So today I, want, um, I will be essentially continuing Mike's um, introduction to simplicial sets and a lot of interesting things about them. But I'll be starting to steer slightly more into a new direction, um, which then I and um, Chris, who is not here at the moment, will probably continue over the next few weeks of um, showing, um, giving the construction of Vyvodsky's simplicial set model of type theory. So this is um, simplicial sets. towards the model of type theory, the univalent model. And what I want to do today is, is mainly just to get to know weak factorization systems a bit better, which are one of the key technical tools, both for the homotopy theory of simplicial sets generally and particularly in constructing the univalent model, one works with them a lot. So I want to start with um, some more on the concrete examples that we already met um, in Mike's last lecture of cofibrations and fibrations. So in simplicial sets, that is. Then I want to generalize that a bit more. I'll introduce general weak factorization systems. and look at some of the um, general things one can always do in those, and generalize some of the concrete examples we've looked at first. Then I want to detour a bit and um, go into the first way that the connections of type theory appear in these, which is the identity type weak factorization system. And finally, um, and this is probably, of course, past what we'll fit in today, but I'd like to get to the model structure on simplicial sets, where a model structure is a very handy um, technical set of axioms for an environment um, which build together a couple of different weak factorization systems satisfying some exceedingly useful relationships. Um, and <coughs> this, so for those of you who've um, seen the, who know the proof, or a proof, that um, the model structure on the simplicial sets works, you can immediately deduce from this table of contents that I will not be giving all proofs. This takes um, about 25 pages to do in the shortest presentation of it that, I, um, that I've seen. I will, um, the proofs I give will be geared towards not necessarily being the most important proofs, but to be the ones which um, kind of introduce the techniques of reasoning with weak factorization systems and, um, and so on, which, so proofs that introduce the techniques of reasoning with those that will be particularly useful as we go on to get to the simplicial model itself and the, um, the kind of more novel aspects of it. So um, last time, Mike um, introduced the vibrations which were def defined in um, simplicial sets by a map um, P from Y to X is a vibration if whenever we have a commutative um, square with P on the right-hand side and one of the um, canonical horn inclusions between simplices on the left-hand side, we have some filler for that square. So <coughs> different ways of kind of saying that, whenever we have a horn in <coughs> um, upstairs and, a f and an extension that to a full simplex downstairs, then we can lift that full simplex downstairs to one living upstairs over it and filling the original horn. Um, a sort of helpful way to think of it. And um, this can be seen as giving a bunch of different things, composites, um, transport, and so on between fibers. But concentrating less on um, the picture of what's going on within each vibration and more on the sort of external big picture, let's abstract a bit and kind of say generally what's going on. So 
So generally, if we've got two maps, um, call them i, let's say from a to b, and p from y to x, we say um, that i is weakly orthogonal to p, and we use this funny upside down pitchfork sign. Um, so we say that i is weakly orthogonal to p if every square between them has a filler. So this relationship that we've used here. Um, um, I read it. I would read it as weakly orthogonal. Um, Latex calls it, I think, pitchfork. Um, so it's a. Um, and constructively, of course, let's note that this is something which. It's um, not clear. Um, depending on context, one usually probably wants to think of a propositions of types as an interpretation of a, a situation where one's equipped with a chosen filler somehow for each such square. It's constructively one, um, typically one very much needs to retain the information of fillers for squares. So um, then what's happening when we're defining um, the vibrations? We're taking a class of maps, the basic horn inclusions, and looking at all the maps that are orthogonal to those. So. So given any set, um, let's call it J, of maps in the category C, we can define um, J right upper pitchfork um, as a set of maps such that, um, of maps which are orthogonal on the right to everything in our basic set. And so this is now what we're doing when we define vibrations. So um, we can restate the definition of vibrations, if I can draw a, calli a calligraphic F, um, as being that F is the, um, the set of the inclusions of the horns into the simplices it's the right pitchfork of that. It's a, all the maps orthogonal on the right to all of those. Um, then analogously, we can also define, um, so everything um, that one starts with in the basic theory of, we, of um, orthogonality like this, everything is symmetric between the left and right. One can just as we define the um, things that are orthogonal to all of a class on the right, we can also say everything that's orthogonal to all of these on the left. So, um, so similarly, if we have um, given a class, we have the left pitchfork is everything um, that's orthogonal to the left on the left of everything in this class. And so now we can um, repeat this and look on the left, um, look at the things that are orthogonal on the left to the vibrations. Um, and I'll call this class TC. So the things that are orthogonal on the left to all vibrations. Um, I'll call these trivial co-fibrations. And this is a slightly um, idiosyncratic abuse of terminology. It's the, ordinarily, these would, um, it's, um, one defines these under a slightly different name and then proves that this is equivalent to being a co-fibration and a weak equivalence in the sense that Mike defined the other day. Um, and calls that trivial co-vibrations. 
I'll just come to it from a slightly uh, different direction, taking trivial co-fibrations to be the name that we call these from the get-go. And again, we'll still need to prove that these are that being a trivial co-fibration is equivalent to being a co-fibration and a weak equivalence. Um, but by definition, I'll take trivial co-fibration to mean this rather than to mean weak equivalence and co-fibration. So trivial co-fibrations are all the things. Um, so a map um, from A to B is a trivial co-fibration if uh, every fibration P and every commutative square from um, from I to that fibration, we can always find a fellow. So the th they're the things which we can lift against fibrations as though they were horns. Yep. So you write it as if it is an integer? Um, thank you, yes. I'm um, slightly jumping out of myself in doing that. Yeah. But yes, these will be all inclusions. No, exactly. It's not. It's not an immediate from the definition. As I say, I'm slightly jumping ahead in saying that. Yeah. Uh, so. So similarly, um, Mike talked last time about um, how if one had something that was a vibration and a weak equivalence, it was then um, orthogonal not just to the inclusion of horns but to the inclusions of boundaries. And so we'll take that as the definition of a class TF um, as all the things which um, against which one can lift the inclusions of the boundaries So this is, um, we've got inclusion of the boundary, and we've got our putative um, trivial vibration. So whenever we've got a boundary upstairs and a simplex downstairs, we can fill that simplex downstairs. And Mike started to sketch um, how this looks um, very much like a, um, topological de um, description of something being having trivial homotopy groups. One can, whenever one has the um, endpoints of some path, or more generally the boundary of some sphere upstairs, um, if these are connected downstairs, then we can lift that, and so they're connected upstairs. If two paths are homotopic downstairs, then they're also homotopic upstairs, and so on. And now, um, we can again do this trick of um, passing again over to the left and define cofibrations are all the things which we can lift as though they were boundaries against this. So, now, If these were um, just abstract, then all well and good, we wouldn't be able to do that much, much with them. So we need to get a bit of a handle on what they are. And the first key couple of propositions we can give are that are one useful thing for testing against, uh, for testing when things belong in these. And this is that the, um, the pitchforking if, it, well, if we go around both ways, it's idempotent. So oh, um, oh sorry, if, if we go around three ways, it's the same as once. So um, So if we pitch fork once on the right, the same as going to the right, left and right again. And so, in particular, that says that the fibrations 
they were defined as being to, um, to be a vibration was equivalent to test against um, be a vibration you had to test against just the horns, but equivalent it's equivalent to test against all the trivial co vibrations. And similarly, for the trivial co vibrations, it's equivalent to test against all the co vibrations. And this is um, immediate um, if, so uh, as a Cantor theorist, one can say, this is these given a junction on a, um, on a poset. So then this, um, any adjunction on a poset is um, idempotent, so we're good. On the other hand, simply concretely, one can say, so certainly if we've got, um, if we've got something that's orthogonal to, um, so certainly any of the original basic horns are co-fibrations, since if I've got any fibration, I can lift any basic horn against it. So then um, if I'm orthogonal to um, all of these, then I'm certainly orthogonal to all of those. So we've got the, using the contravariance there, So this is contained in um, J pitch fork. So if I'm orthogonal to all co-fibrations, in particular I'm orthogonal to the basic horns, so I'm certainly a fibration. Um, conversely, if I'm a fibration, then I'm certainly orthogonal to everything that's orthogonal to all fibrations. So the other way around also goes. And this is simply itself an instance of the dual of that. So this is clear. Um, so, um, so we can test. So when we want to test whether a map is one of these things, we have multiple equivalent ways to do it. But concretely, um, now let's start to try and see what we can say about them. So, uh, on the, um, so before going to moving to the general setting, let's look um, look specifically at the co-fibrations versus the trivial fibrations. So. A map of some special sets is a cofibration if and only if it's a monomorphism. How can we show this? So the first um, so the first um, direction that we can kind of we can pretty um, kind of jump in and show straight off is that monomorphism implies cofibration. And for this, um, so we can say, suppose that A and B is Um, is a monomorphism, then um, we can consider it as um, so as built up where in each direction we th um, dimension we throw in all the new things of the next dimension up. So. So, oh, sorry. Um, A goes into A naught, goes into A one, goes into A two, and so on. Into B, 
where a n is a subset of b um, Um, is the consisting of A to, plus also all the simplices of dimension A. Um, less than or equal to n. So in a naught, we throw in all the zero cells of b. a1, we throw in all the one cells. Um, no, sorry? Um, yes, so for each n, we're defining a n this way. Yeah. Um, so, um, and also, to be a subsimplicial set, we need to also throw in the degeneracies on these. So. So, um, so this, um, so now we certainly have all of these. How does this help us show it's a cofibration? Well, the idea is if we want to um, lift this against a fibration, it's enough to lift each of these bits in turn. So, so each a n into a n plus 1 is a cofibration. And to take in this base case, let's call this a minus 1. Um, so So for this, um, we've got uh, um, so we've got some trivial vibration that we're trying to lift against. And <coughs> we're looking at this. And we want a filler there. And now for each, so to construct the filler, so for each simplex of an plus 1, if it's in um, an, then we use the, um, let's, see, so let's call this um, it's f and g. So if it's already an a n, then we just we know we have to use f um, in constructing the map into y. If it's um, if it's in a um, so if it's in the new dimensions that we've just thrown in, then its boundary. is in um, an. So we've now got um, our simplex and its boundary. We've got the simplex downstairs. We know how to map it into x. little x to the name of our simplex. Um, we know how to map this into x. The boundary we know how to map into um, y, because it, um, that lay in a of n. And so we can fill that by the definition of a trivial vibration. Um, um, so this gives us. a value for g of x itself. Um, 
And then this. also extends to degeneracies, um, extends uniquely to degeneracies um, since um, all the degeneracies in here come from s some degeneracy over one of these new n plus 1 simplexes, Oops. and so gets determined by one of these. Um, so which separation? Okay, so uh, if it is an AN, you need this. This, yeah? Um, from a constructive point of view, this is still making decidability assumptions. We would need to, um, here to assume something like that the original inclusion from A into B was, mono was decidable, I think. And I think if one assumes that, then the rest um, goes through, since as you say, the only other aspect is the dimension. Oh, and the, de sorry, and the degeneracies of B, yep. Yes, so we need A to be A and the degeneracies to be decidable inside B as well. Yeah, so I mean it's very well because the statement is very nice. I mean it makes yeah. sense for computers. Yeah. Mono to be mono yeah. and all the definitions for that. So as we call your question in communication ethics standards, shift level, this property comes. I I don't know off the top of my head. Mike? There's a I think that, that the, um, the induction on N aspect of this is indeed not necessary because one can get the more channel version going. But the decidability assumptions sort of thing, if anything, those get worse when one does the general Sidinsky case, the things one needs to take for that. So this, yeah, this case, pot, I think, needs slightly fewer modifications to go constructive than the general case would. Um. Yep. Yes. Yes, I think so. That um, yes, the general monomorphisms aren't this nice against conclusion. So. Um, so we um, we break down the construction of the the extension of A into B by throwing in all the simplices of each dimension in turn. Um, so throwing in first all the zero simplices, then all the one simplices, um, then all the two simplices, and so on. And then... Um, yeah. um, well, we, we throw in A from the very beginning, and then of the remaining ones, we throw in all the, yeah, all the n simplices at stage n. Um, if, we, if we don't have qualms about um, pulling the axiom of choice in, then we can we could even say well order all the simplices within each of these and add the simplices simply one at a time in some huge long chain. So this is, a, it's now. So this is now it's an omega stage chain over all n's over all natural numbers n, and the co-limit of that all is b. And I'll do the co-limiting stage in a moment. I've not I've not quite finished the argument. We will in a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. So um, this shows that each of so this shows that each of these um, finite stages is a cofibration, and so to get that B is, we just have to pass to a colimit. So. We can see that B is, in the explicit description, B is the co-limit 
of all the ANs. And so if we have a map from, if we're trying to lift the whole of A into B against some um, vibration, sorry, some trivial vibration, then what can we do? Well, we can decompose this into this long chain. And then for each one in turn, we can find some lifting. So, so for A naught into Y, we first imagine turning all of these into a single map from A naught to X. That's now some square with something we know is a co-fibration on the left and the trivial fibration on the right, so we can lift here. Now we look at the same thing from um, A1. Again, we look at this as a square which we know we can lift. And so we obtain... Um, maps from each a n in turn, since they're fillers for the square, these triangles always commute. And so then that together gives us a map out of the co-limit into y, which gives a filler for the whole square. And so this um, shows that we're done. Um, bit. You start with a B in the beginning. Yep. I beg, um, beg your pardon, I, should, I guess, depending on how one thinks co-limits, one should say isomorphic. Here, this is, um, these are all subsets of B, and since they throw in all the n simplices by stage n, then the union of these is all of B, and, and so B is a co-limit of these. Um, one way to see, that, see it is that co-limits are point-wise in, as in a, any pre-sheaf category, but if we look at any individual dimension, then after stage n, this, cha this chain stabilizes and is all isomorphisms. So in each dimension, Bn is certainly the co-limit of this chain, and so overall it is. Um, and it gets slightly confused by your notation. You don't distinguish between mono and inclusion, right? Um, no, again, yep, since we're in a pre-sheaf category, and so... Mono is the same as injective in each item. You don't distinguish between inclusion, right? Ah, no, I don't. Okay. Sorry, yep, yes. Um, I'm not distinguishing between literal subsets and injections. I beg your pardon. Thank you. Yep. Um, if, yes. Yep, I hope that's. Um, and so the two, um, the, we can abstract the steps of this. So what Peter Johnson would call um, three scolia um, from this proof, th um, three points that we can see pull out from the proof of this are that firstly, um, this, so this stage, what we're doing in the extension from each A1 to AN plus one, we are taking a whole bunch of new syntheses whose boundaries are already in there and then gluing them on to a n plus one. That's this, so this relationship is described by that, and that was what we used essentially in these steps. So, saying a a coproduct of co of cofibrations is a cofibration, and more generally, actually. This uh, works whenever we have anything defined as a left class. So first we're, we're saying we can do not one simplex, but a whole bunch of simplices at once. Also, we can, if we glued the simplices on something we already had, then we can do that. So. Um, let me read that out more generally after I finish the scolium. Yep. Finished writing the same tells. Yeah, expand that in a moment. So a push out, and I'll explain this also. A push out of a cofibration, generally um, any class defined by this, is again that. And the third step, the last one we did was a transfinite composition, 
which um, some people might think, prefer to think of as a well-ordered sequential co-limage. One can call it any number of things. Um, of co-fibrations is, again, a co-fibration. Um, this step, I think it's, it's essentially completely clear how that generalizes um, from, from the version we did here. These bits, it's a bit pushing it to call them scolia since we smush them into one step here. So let's say a bit more carefully what they are. So um, we'll need space to draw a diagram for this. We've got So we've got um, I, um, I from A to B and I primed from A primed to B primed, all cofibrations. Um, then the, by the coproduct, I mean I plus I primed going from A plus A primed to B plus B primed. We have any lifting problem we need to solve. Um, so this is one of the right maps. Then this situation, um, it um, pulls apart into um, the separate maps from A and A primed into Y maps from B and B primed both into X. Both of these squares have fillers, and those fillers now pair back together to give a map from the original B plus B primed into X. So one just takes the coproduct, looks at its two halves separately, mapping out of those, and then puts them back in. So. For the pushouts, it's very similar. One works explicitly, given a lifting problem. Um, so we've got um, some i, which we're assuming is in the class of left maps. We push it out along any map f. I'll start aligning the names of objects um, since we really haven't been using them. We push i out along any map f. And we want to show that this map, f star i, that this is, um, again, in our class. So if we have any lifting problem to solve for that, we've got some p in the right maps. We want a filler for that. Well, we know that by composing this square with the square from the pushout, we've now got this entire rectangle. Since i was in the left maps, we have this filler here making things commute. But then that filler um, gives us now, um, from these two objects, a, we've got two maps into here making that commute. So it descends to the pushout and gives us the filler we want. Um, so this gives um, coproducts, pushouts, um, transfinite compositions. And there's one more which we didn't yet use um, in this example, um, which is. So you're using the universal property of the pushout. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, so the. Um, the existence part of the universal property of the pushout is what gives us this filler, and then the uniqueness part is what tells us that the, um, that the lower triangle will still commute. Um, so the fourth canonical closure condition one can give
is that um, anything defined as a left class is closed under retracts. So by a retract, I mean that we've got um, we've got something which is known to be in R, and then we've got some uh, map that we want to show is in there, and this is a retract of I. In that the square commutes. And um, and then each of these is a retraction. So each of those composites is an identity. Then um, by a completely concrete argument, very similar to those others, um, f is again in the left class, and this is. If you've, if you've seen these before, you've almost certainly done this exercise. If you haven't, it's a short one and a fun one. So these give us a lot of general cl um, closure conditions for the left maps. So a lot of ways to show that something is a left map. How can we show something in the converse direction that every cofibration is mono? So that everything in something defined by some left class has some property. And for this, um, we typically need to pass um, to, um, to look um, at a slightly stronger um, kind of technology and give the general definition of weak factorization systems. So weak factorization systems take what we've been looking at so far, um, and they appear to add an extra ingredient, but actually it turns out to have been in there all along. So um, and those what will um, these are what will allow us to prove that every cofibration is mono. So a weak factorization um, system on a category C is classes of maps. Um, which we call L and R. So they're related just like the vibrations and trivial cofibrations were, or the trivial vibrations and cofibrations. Each one is the set of all things orthogonal to the other one. And, and what's the factorization bit? Um, and every map. has a factorization as, so given any map f in the category, we can factor it as a map from the left class flood, followed by a map from the right class. Um, so we're not, um, so in the classical definition, we don't make any kind of assumption of explicit choices, certainly no kind of coherence or functoriality between them, unless we specifically ask that as an extra aspect. Um, the basic definition simply says there exists always some factorization. Um, there are very nice um, enhancements of this that do include um, some more about the specification of choices and good functoriality and related ideas. So. Those are natural and algebraic weak factorization systems um, and variants. And those, so for, for possibly moving to the constructive setting, the impression I have, and I don't know how far this has been worked out, but um, is that the algebraic weak factorization systems, that version of these, should transfer much better on the whole to the constructive setting than the plain classical definition. But that's. Just about to give it. Um, so the simplest and most typical example is all the examples of orthogonal class of maps we've been seeing so far turn into these. 
and I guess you're right. Okay, that's yeah, that's you're right. That's f that's far from the simplest example. Um, let's give let's give us some for example. Um, so. We look at um, monarchs and epis on sets. So injections and surjections on sets. Um, and um, then, wait, I mean, there's, sorry, I sh since I didn't prepare this, it's dangerous to launch in because there's two areas around that this works, and one works straightforwardly, and the other always has a hiccup that just about everyone I've seen ever presenting this falls into, and I'm going to fall into it myself here. Uh, so let's see. Um, so let's see. So if, if we're claiming that monarchs on the left and effies on the right works, then um, is it true that whenever we've got a monarch followed by an epi in sets we can factor it. By the axiom of choice, this has a section. And so um, we go along and up by the section, and that gives us a filler, which is a filler. Um, so the ortho um, which is a filler due to the monomorphism. Fact. So uh, sorry? Um, yes, we do. Yeah. Um, so, so we can we can look at both of those ways and also look at that one. But yes, yeah, so in this one, we'll, well, the factorization we look at in the moment will be the opposite way around to the normal image factorization. Um, so. Uh, um, so we define the f we can define a filler here on um, A and the complement of A separately to make explicit the um, um, the, the complement of complementedness, and on this by we've chosen a section by the axiom of choice. So this gives us orthogonality, and then for the factorization systems, um, we, um, if we have any f from x to y, then we can simply use the um, coproduct x plus y here. This is certainly an injection, um, and then this is certainly a surjection, so where this is the co-pair. f on the identity of y. And this is the co-product injection. Um, and also, so this is then the, the direction around that works comparatively straightforwardly. And then there's the non extremely non-constructively, yes. Yep. The normal way around the factorization is non-constructive uh, sorry, is perfectly constructive, but then the orthogonality has, doesn't it? Let's, well, let's see how it goes. Um, is it? So if is this not where we have the hiccup with something needing to be non-empty? Um, so we've got an epi and a mono. Um, And I guess we know this factors through here since the square commutes. So this tells us automatically that that goes round. And I guess this just works. Just works. OK. 
just works. I, I swear one of these normally has something more complicated. Call that, other thing. that other thing hiccup? Yeah. Okay, fine, great. Then this, this way run works beautifully then. Um, yep. Um, and then, yep, okay. And it commutes on there after the computation with the by. Yep, okay, great, everything works. Um, so on sets, um, constructively, this way around works nicely, and classically, that way around also works nicely. Ah, yes. Yep, you're right. We haven't been, yes, we've been not showing these two conditions um, either way around. Um, let, for the, yes, yep, yep. And let's see, are and are those then closed under the under retracts appropriately? Let's see, split FEs. Yeah. Um, So is it, is it clear that everything orthogonal to a split FE is a complement in mono? Um, OK, so let's take that as a note. Um, as a question mark note. So complemented monos. Split epis with something of the question mark in that we may have to close under retracts or something to make it work. But um, means that so a mono such that the subject it includes has a complement. Um, so yes, so there's a little more shown these of the each class being the orthogonal closure of the right one. I might do. Um, will you forgive me if I leave that as? But, uh, kind of discussion with the interested reader and get back to the main thing. So um, the key thing is, as we've seen, it's very straightforward and very natural to get classes which are orthogonal to each other these way, this way. But then how do you have the factorization systems? And here there is a really lovely th um, theorem which comes to our aid and under a wide range of circumstances gives us the factorizations for free or very nearly for free. So this is a theorem. Um, it's the famous small object argument. Um, it's due to um, Quillen originally and significantly elaborated by Bousfield and I'll add a name which is, I think, m for many category theorists, a kind of nice um, different, um, different way of presenting it and seeing the proof which makes it more, uh, more amenable to kind of category theoretic methods and also, I think, more amenable to constructive treatments, which is that Richard Garner has a very nice paper which kind of algebraicizes this. Um, and I should not start on the proof if I've at least given the statement of the theorem as well as the name and pedigree of it. Um, so, so if C is, it's given in, this isn't quite the most general form, but it's um, one which suits our purposes. So if C is a locally presentable category, which very, very roughly says that its objects have 
reasonable notions of cardinality that behave well um, with um, under co-limits. So if C is a locally presentable category, and um, J is um, any um, small family of maps of C then um, we can do what we did in simplicial sets a couple of times just now. We can say, take the right maps to be everything that the J is um, left against, and then we can take the left maps to be the extension of that, the closure of that to everything that was that lifted against all of these. And then we get, um, we get factorizations. We get a weak factorization system. And um, and so the proof, very roughly, um, so given a map from um, x um, um, down to y, call it f, We construct exactly. Exactly, I beg your pardon. Yes. So the orthogonality is clear um, for the reasons we went through before. Then we need to construct the factorizations, and we do this as a um, by making a sequence um, x naught into x one into x two, and so on. Um, All living over y, um, we make a long transfinite sequence. Um, and the idea is that each of these is going to get a little bit closer to being a vibration over y, to being a right map over y. Um, we take co-limits at limit stages. And eventually, it'll be a vibration. Um, so where each, um, and so um, what do we do to get from x to n plus, xn to xn plus 1 to make it a little bit more like a vibration? So it's constructed by gluing on all the missing lifts. So each lift that we, so each commutative square that we would like to be able to lift against this map, sometimes we can lift it already, sometimes we can't. And if we can't, um, then now we have a map from the boundary into xn and from the simplex for the domain and codomain of the J map into Xn. So we can take that push out to glue a bit more onto Xn. And we do that with all the lifts that are missing. We glue those all on, call that Xn plus 1. Now that, of course, may have some more missing lifts, but still, it's got all the ones that were missing from there. And when we take the co-limit long enough, then since we're locally presentable and J is a small set, um, we can check. And in the end, we get. Um, and sooner or later, we'll have all the lifts we need. So, um, so now it's non-constructive in several places. But this is where um, the um, Richard Garner's approach, which works a little bit more carefully, um, and it remembers the structures of the lifts and works with algebraic weak factorization systems, is, I want to say, constructive. I should probably say closer to being constructive because the transfinite construction that it uses, the transfiniteness, is one which the isn't, as far as I know, a good um, treatment of. On the other hand, there should be one. Mike and I have actually thought about this a bit and sort of have something along those lines. But it's um, the 
yeah, there isn't, as far as I know, a contractual treatment of con transfinite constructions that covers this one. Um, right now. But it doesn't. But the steps are constructed. Yeah, the steps are completely constructed. So in this, so in this version, yep. So I'm what I sketched was the classical version where we make a distinction between the lifts which are missing and the ones which aren't. In the classical version, you actually, you don't even need to make in the classical that. Classical version, you just throw in all of them. That's true. You need just throw in, yeah. Um, but in um, in the algebraic version, you don't make that distinction. You just you remember the structure of the liftings that already existed, and w and then you glue in all the liftings. But the ones which already existed, you identified with their existing cho chosen liftings. Why bother? Doesn't this issue appear in the Sorry? Why bother identifying superfluous? Um, so, this, so if one just cares about existence of um, the factorizations, then the, su the superfluity doesn't really either help or hurt. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference. If one does it the slightly more algebraic way, though, then you get a lot more things um, um, out of it, like functoriality of the construction, universal properties for it, and so on. I so. In, in the algebraic version, one doesn't make this distinction of you do one thing if it's missing and another if it isn't. Sorry, that, w that was a red herring that I perhaps shouldn't have said. Um, in, the, in the algebraic version, you, you do glue in all the liftings, whether they were there already or not, but then the ones which were there already, you identify the newly glued in versions with the existing versions, with the chosen ones. No, there isn't. But yes, so in, in the constructive treatment, um, I think one passes to a non-linear version. But, um, so this is, so, um, the, so Garner's slick presentation of, um, of the proof of this goes via the um, general constructions of free monads on possibly pointed endofunctors or, um, and free algebraic structures. And so, those classically use these linear transfinite constructions, but again, can be loosened up to not need that. Yeah, the constraint. Just so in. Um, yeah. Yeah. One, one can use an appropriate inductive type to give the indexing of this when one does it algebraically. Um, and if, if it's an essentially being long enough, so classically it has to be long enough so as to be um, of cofinality or filteredness at least as good as the maximal size of things that appear in J. Um, and so constructively, we take some W type and that, or some, sorry, some in, um, inductive type and give it constructors whose arities are as large as the things that appear in J. And that makes it long enough or big enough. So, um, but the, the picture to bear in mind is that at each stage we're simply gluing on some more of um, these J maps, which one can think of as gluing, uh, gluing on simplices along possibly horns or possibly boundaries, depending on whether we're talking about um, clear vibrations or trivial ones. And then the result of this, it gives. A vibration by the um, local presentability issues um, and then the long map along the top becomes a um, ends up as a sorry I shouldn't say a vibration I should have said a 
just on the map. Um, and then the long map uh, along the top is in the left class by transfinite composition of pushouts of coproducts. So things we've seen before. And this picture of gluing in more and more cells is the one I kind of always have in mind for anything that's constructive, um, constructing factorizations. But now, this actually has given something slightly stronger than just that the um, than just that we had the factorizations, because we know that the left factorization wasn't just some random off-the-shelf thing in the left class of maps, but it was constructed in this particular way as um, a um, as a long um, transfinite pushouts of coproducts. And since we keep saying this phrase, let's give it a name, this is um, often called a J cell complex. And there's an evident, um, one can connect this back fairly clearly to the definition of cell complexes in topology, where one glues along disks, one keep iteratively glues in disks along arbitrary boundary maps. Um, so then, Oh, thank you. Yes, I beg your pardon. I always. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and so we can pull a scolium out of this that says um, in a weak factorization system of this form, every, um, um, every left map. is a retract of a relative um, J cell complex. So how can we see this? We take any, um, so we take any left map, we factor it using the factorization given above. And so, um, we have I primed and P where I primed is a J cell complex and P is a right map. But now, one can show that I is a retract of I primed by looking at the um, since we look at the square where we have take i on the left, um, i prime up there and p down here, and then this gives um, a map from that to there. Give, um, then we can expand that top triangle out to give, um, let's see, what do we do next? We um, don't show i as a retract of i primed. Um, how do we get the map from? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so we have S, um, and how do we get the map from I prime back to I? Okay. Oh, no, of course, yes. I don't need to here on the bottom. Yep. So this gives I as a retract I of I primed. And so from this, we can see that if we had, if we knew from the start that um, if, um, 
if we have some class M, suggestively named, um, and we know that all the J is all the generating left maps um, were in there, and M is closed under um, pushouts, co-products, um, transfinite composition, and retracts, then all the left maps are in this class M, since these ensure that every um, J cell complex remains in M, since it's constructed out of all these things, starting with J. And then every left map we now know is a retract of a cell complex, so again in M. And this finally gives us back that um, that in the, so, meanwhile, back on the ranch, um, every co-fibration is a monomorphism. That the generating co-fibrations, these inclusion of things into their boundaries, all of those were monomorphisms. And monomorphisms are certainly closed under all these operations um, in a topos. And so every co-fibration that we can make stays ending up being a mono. Um, so this is, so for now, I want to take a, do we have till 12.30, by the way? Is that, yeah. Um, so what about the condition local to virtually? 